So what I'm going to talk about today is in part history of medicine as a, as, a, as, a, as a subject matter, as an art, and in part about an old chestnut, which is uh, uh, John Snow and cholera. Uh, there's more about history of medicine. Um, in, in any history, including history of medicine, as we say, people take the longest possible paths, digress to numerous dead ends, and make all kinds of mistakes. Then historians, that's moi, come along and write summaries of this messy nonlinear process and make it appear like a simple straight line. Now, here's my lament. Is, is, uh, I can't see the, the audience here. Is, is uh, Charlie here? Yes. Uh, Charlie. Uh, Charlie gave a wonderful course on the atomic bomb. And uh, this was mentioned both in the video and came through in his course, the industrialization of research. And this is uh, uh, the picture that Charlie has is Alfred Loomis here, the guy from Tuxedo Park. He was sort of the last of the gentleman scientists. And then Vannevar Bush, who industrialized research, he brought in 150 people into uh, top scientists in MIT. And God because knows how much. Yeah, that's not Alfred Loomis. Mm -mm. That's not Alfred Loomis? No, he's over on the other side, I think, uh, on the right, far him? right. Is that him here? Uh, I can't tell because I'm oh, looking at you. I just, uh, I just clicked on the slide by mistake. It's okay. We get the idea. Uh, <laughs> back up here. What did I do here? You're back. You're good. There he is. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's him. Oh, you put me in the picture too. All right. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. that's him at the far right. That's how awesome. was. Okay. Right. I'm trying to get the whole page. I'm not going up here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Now, <clears throat> oh, yeah, this is Dr. Hall. He's in the group. I thought you were in the group, Joe, of the yeah. prominent scientists. Uh, we're, we're seeing yeah. PowerPoint. We're not seeing the slideshow. So it's correct. It's, You're seeing the real PowerPoint. Correct. Yeah. Um, okay. So <clears throat> now in, in Charlie's course, uh, a wonderful course on the atomic bomb, that you could see this in the first part he had. The, the scientists work in, in, in small laboratories, small academic departments, and they had wonderful stories. Well, they had Marie Curie, Ernest Rutherford, I guess, Lisa Meitner, Max Planck, uh, Arthur Holly Compton, Otto Frisch, Niels Bohr, a whole bunch of, tons of great stories. Then the second part, when it became industrialized, it was more about uh, uh, facilities like uh, uh, like at the University of Chicago, the, the, that top secret lab, metallurgical lab, uh, the... Uh, Oak Ridge uh, reactor, uh, the Hannaford site in Washington State, and of course the Los Alamos Laboratory. We talked about facilities, technology, equipment, product, the personal stories. There were too many people. You couldn't get a, a good personal story because um, uh, historians, you know, they, we tell stories. And what you really want is a protagonist with a confidant, a love interest, and a supporting character. Here is Tonto and his supporting character, the Lone Ranger. And, oh, this is the Cisco Kid and Poncho. My patient, Clark Andrews, wrote the book, Cisco, the Cisco Kid. And he wrote the screenplay for the TV show, The Cisco Kid. Then he moved to Boston when he retired. And the protagonist has a mission, finds an obstacle, gets a goal, and becomes a hero. That's a story. And so once, once it became industrialized, we didn't have the great stories like we had before from before. Now, I wanted to show you a timeline of some of the people that you're familiar with. And either I made it their most important publication or I just made it when they were about middle age uh, to, uh, and they were having an impact. So Galileo was 1600 and Kepler was just after that. Then there was science before Isaac Newton and there was science after Isaac Newton, you know, you know completely different. Now, to me, Daniel Bernoulli was important because he did a lot of the work with gases. Uh, he was a, math, a Swedish math, mathematician. I'm going to skip Carl Linnaeus because nobody knows who he is. I'm going to tell you who he is. Then Edward Jenner, he was the first person to really lock in disease states and biological material when he uh, uh, put cowpox from the uh, people who lived on farms into the uh, into arms of pe other people and then they couldn't get smallpox. They had no concept of, uh, of the virus but he was using living matter to prevent disease. That was a huge change in the way thinking was. Avogadro was one of the first real prominent scientists to look at a mass, 
when he his paper was published in 1806, when he looked at um, mass and volume, and that was the beginning of, of uh, understanding gases. And Ohm, of course, was electricity, one of the big uh, uh, people in electricity. Now, this is an important date here, especially because the London, can you, oh, let me get this. The London cholera outbreak was 1854. I'm going to keep reminding you that. So Darwin's origin of species was only 1849. So it was virtually unknown because of the way information didn't travel in those days. So then that's where John Snow comes in. Pasteur is eight years later when he published on bacteria. So there was no concept, no, no even a concept of the bacterium when John Snow was uh, uh, doing his thing. And Robert Koch was very important because he isolated in 1883 uh, tuberculosis. He passed it from person, well, from animal to animal, rabbits, or animal to animal to animal, showing that uh, uh, with George R. Koch's postulates that you could cause the disease, you could pass it on and, and, and cause the disease again, uh, showing that life forms are of some sort, which was tuberculosis, cause disease. Now, the one, does anybody know, I'm just curious, does anybody know who Carl Linnaeus was? Sure. Yes. Who was he? Who you do? He's a Swedish botanist. Yeah, he is a, he is a Swedish botanist. Well, and, so he created the main classification of known living things. Exactly. What he did, this was an, an enormous contribution. What he did was he, uh, he created a hierarchy. And it goes domain, kingdom. Sometimes you see a realm in there. Phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and subspecies. And that permitted people, subsequent people, to understand the organization of life, that, that everything was related. And he had six kingdoms of life, uh, which, which, which went down into a, into a giant hierarchy. And that um, brought out the whole field of ontogeny and phylogeny. Ontogeny is uh, embryological development. And that this was, this, uh, the, uh, Linnaeus permitted people to, enable people to think this way that in all the embryos start out looking alike. Like these are supposed to all look alike at the top row. And this one becomes a toad or a salamander, whatever that is. And this one differentiates into a hog and this one differentiates into a human. But at various stages, they look alike. So the ontogeny recapitulates uh, the phylogeny. So you get these, when you start looking at the embryos, this is long before DNA. You could look that, you say, well, this, African clawed dog, that embryo looked the same as this embryo here. So here's where they se separated out from the, was it a Chinese hamster? And you could just see the relationship between all of these uh, uh, different species and when they differentiated. And are you perhaps, showing us, what's that? Are you showing us that? Aren't you seeing that? Uh, right? no. Recapit you know, see recapitulation theory? No, no. I'm just, I'm st seeing your timeline still. Oh. Let me just move this over here. Is this still a slide or is it another application? Oh, it's still the slide. I'm trying to get it up. No, it's just Teams. You're not in the slideshow mode. You're in the edit. Oh, well, screen share is, is paused. I'm sorry. I don't know how I did that. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to stop share and start share again so I can figure this out here. When in doubt, restart. <laughs> now, now, what are you seeing? John Snow. John Snow. You're, not, you're seeing a full presentation, not the uh, working one with the slides on the side. You're seeing your 11th slide. Slides at the side. Oh, you're seeing slides at the side. Yep. Uh, now you're on 12. Slide, cholera. But you're going 13. You're, you're not in slideshow mode. Oh, yeah, I am on, on the other screen is the problem. Right? Um, I can see the slides. Oh. Oh, I went to the, wrong, I'm, I'm sharing the wrong screen. screen. Uh, that's what I have to, I'm going to have to ask you what screen you see. I'm going to go to this. Go. Cool. This. If 
I move this here. Same thing. Now I'm going to go. It's PowerPoint, here. not full screen. Yeah, now no. I'm going to go to full screen here. Uh, now you're on a full screen here? No okay. change. Are you seeing the, are you seeing autogeny recapitulates phylogeny as a full no, screen? Seeing, we're seeing okay. cholera bacteria. We're body. seeing slide 13. Correct. Yeah. This is the rearrangement uh, mode. Now you're seeing Carl Linnaeus, right? In a, and now I'm no. going to go, you're not seeing Carl on, Linnaeus? Yeah, I'm still seeing seeing a slide titled cholera. With a, real, a, yeah. yeah, that's uh, gram negative, so on, so on. That's, that's Linnaeus. That's what you're seeing? We're seeing slide 13. So Jerry, do your presentation from the PowerPoint, no, no. not the full screen. What are you, what are you seeing now? Same thing. Nothing changed. History, history of medicine. Right, history of medicine. People take longest yeah. paths. Yep, with your with your slides at the side, as well. You know, you're, you're, we're seeing your. Uh, Three story story element. Next one, number two. Yes. I don't Three. understand why. Well, let me go. Oh, I see here. Here it is. Controls. I don't want to do that. Jerry, if you just show it from this, it's good enough. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. You're seeing, okay, I can do it from here. But, uh, so here, you saw this call Linnaeus. Yeah, uh, right. And then, do you see, did you see this hierarchy here? Uh, now we have the hierarchy. Uh, yeah. That's the hierarchy. The, uh, here's where you see domain and kingdom. Sometimes you see a realm here, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And this was but, what enabled- But you can't read it. <laughs> It's too oh, no. small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, the, here is where this enable people to understand ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. As I said, ontogeny is how embryos develop. And these embryos are supposed to be the same. And this one goes down and becomes a fish. This one becomes a hog. And this one becomes a human. But at some point, they, uh, at many points, they look alike. And this is what permit, enables scientists to understand uh, recapitulation theory, which is that um, God didn't... Uh, with these species on Earth all next to each other on a Thursday, <clears throat> but rather you can look at the, let's pick another one, a monkey, and look away up here and you can see these embryos looked alike here. So here's where they divided off to the Chinese hamster and you can see the relationship between the various species and, uh, and where they differentiated off. And now that, that model has that model has stood for over 250 years. Uh, very few uh, people have created a model that can last 250 years. It was really a brilliant, it was a bullseye. It wasn't like you rearranging the, uh, you know, things in your, uh, in your uh, uh, pantry closet to make it convenient. This was an absolute bullseye into how you look at uh, life. So now we're gonna go to John Snow. Now he was a physician in London he only lived to be 45 years old. And he had the very strange idea that cholera was a waterborne disease. And this is where we get into paradigms and the, of, of what disease is and was. Now, John Snow was no lightweight. He was the anesthesiologist to Queen Victoria for the birth of uh, Prince Leopold and Princess Beatrice. He had published on chloroform and ether dosing. And what's interesting is that ether was originally synthesized in the late 1500s, had no use, and was used for ether parties uh, in the early 1800s. People would inhale it, and hard to believe, they would drink it to get high. So there was a recreational drug before it was an anesthetic. It wasn't really used as an anesthetic. People give, uh, you know, the, that William Morton, the, the dentist, he was, at, he was at Mass General. He did a, an operation, I don't know if you've been to the ether dome, in 1846. But there was a man in the South uh, um, uh, Crawford Williamson Long, he uh, um, used it in 1842. He had gone to Penn Med and then went back home to Georgia to practice. And he used ether just himself, but he didn't publish until 1849. And it's publisher parish. He published a little late and that was it. And he's lost <laughs> to antiquity. Uh, he lived alone. He never married and he had no close friends. Uh, what's interesting, uh, you may have heard Queen Victoria, she had hemophilia. And so Prince Leopold, who he deli helped deliver, he was the one with uh, over, she was a carrier and he had the uh, hemophilia. Ends so, up in Russia eventually. 
What would what, you say? I said, and it ends up in Russia. The, yeah, yeah. Well, all these, all, all, all these Europeans were, uh, yeah. were, they were married. They actually only had one chromosome that they uh, shared between them all. Uh, it's good to be a Habsburg. <laughs> if, you, if, if you have hematologists on staff. Um, so I thought I'd give uh, uh, the scientists here a little uh, background on uh, bio, uh, um, bacteriology. Some of you probably remember this from way back, that uh, bacteria divided into two overarching groups based on the staining of their cell walls. And they either gram positive with a capital G, gram positive or gram negative. And this was um, invented by Hans Christian Graham, a, 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 I think a zoologist, a biologist uh, in 1884 in, in Denmark. And at that time, the German aniline dye industry was uh, having an absolute field day at creating new dyes to stain this and that. As you may know, they wiped out the indigo business in um, coming from India because the aniline dyes were so cheap. And, and that got extended to uh, science and, and, and that more of the German scientists were staining everything and, and uh, permitted the understanding of anatomy. Uh, but what, what Graham did was he published a, a paper in 1884 about staining of bacteria. And what he did was he heat fixed the bacteria to a slide. What you do is you just take the bacteria either off the culture plate or off of any medium and you smear it on the slide. You may have done this in lab and then you hold it over a Bunsen burner just to heat it up a bit and it sticks to the slide so it doesn't wash off. And then he applied the dye crystal violet, which is a violet blue indigo color. It's this color in here and it sticks to the wall, the cell wall of the bacteria. Then he added iodine, which denatures things, uh, to the crystal iodide, and that really locks it in to some of the cells. Now, at that point, every one of these cells would be dark indigo, blue, violet color. Uh, but if then you wash it off with either ethanol or acetone, some of them just release the dye and they are invisible. You can't see them at all. So you have to use a counter stain, which is saffron and also called saponin, which is the counter stain, which stains all of the bacteria, but you can't see it in the indigo ones. It's there, but you just can't see it. So the blue ones are, are gram positive and the uh, red ones here are gram negative. And that stands today, gram positive, gram negatives. And one gram negative is the uh, Vibrio cholera, uh, cholera Vibrio, uh, which is gram negative. It's a facultative anaerobe. That means that it can live uh, in the presence of, it doesn't need oxygen to survive, but it can survive in the presence of oxygen. If it, if it couldn't, it would be an obligate anaerobe. And it has a single flagellum in the back, which gives it motility and helps it attach onto uh, uh, its target, meaning the, the intestinal wall. And when the flagellum wafts back and forth, the body of the um, uh, cholera vibrio kind of rotates too, kind of like a canoe uh, wobbling in the water when you paddle it. And so it vibrates. So it's, uh, it's a vibrating cholera or cholera vibrio. And what the cholera does, it's ingested. In the, uh, you just take it by mouth. And a few of the bacteria can survive the acid of the stomach and they reach the small intestine. And here it shows the bacteria in the small intestine. And with the flagellum, they, they propel themselves into the intestinal mucus and into the cells and release cholera toxin, the CT, cholera toxin. Then they come out at some point and multiply, and go back in and release more cholera toxin into the cell wall and then so on down the GI tract and, and, and leave toxin throughout the G, from the stomach all the way down uh, the GI tract. And the toxin is really the problem, not the bacteria. And upon, and, and is, uh, upon entering the cell wall, the cholera toxin initiates several steps and there's no way to say this easily. It leads to the activation of cystic fibrosis, transmembrane conductance, regulator, CTFR, chloride channel proteins. There's no way to say that easy. That is the way it is. Sorry. But what happens in the gut, normally, we put, in, we put chloride into the intestine. And then chloride has a negative charge, so it pulls sodium into the intestine, and it pulls water, and that liquefies the intestinal secretions, and they pass on down, and we reabsorb it uh, primarily in the transverse colon and, and in the distal colon. And this is the enzyme here, CFTR, uh, which uh, um, pushes the chloride in.
Now in cystic fibrosis, which, uh, I can't believe they named an enzyme after disease that is bass backwards. Uh, this is misfolded. It doesn't work very well. It's there, it's sitting there. There's very few cystics without this, uh, people with cystic fibrosis who are, have the null set who don't have this gene, have it as misfolded and it doesn't work. So they have insufficient intestinal and sweat chloride. And so therefore they don't pull sodium and they don't pull water. And from a medical standpoint, the, they have malnutrition, but their main problem is that they have very thick pulmonary secretions that are an ideal uh, reservoir for, uh, source of, for uh, uh, Pseudomonas and other bacteria to grow. And, that, and that's what the uh, cystic fibrosis does. Now the company Vertex Pharmaceuticals, I don't know if you've seen, you can see from down from Rose Wharf, you can see their building in this, uh, across the way. They make um, a medication that helps unfold this, some, of these, uh, some of these phenotypes, the improperly folded uh, protein, and it works somewhat well, fairly well, not too bad. And so, uh, so that's the current treatment of cystic fibrosis. But that's where it doesn't work. In cholera, this works to excess. You pour a ton, a ton of chloride into the gut. And then a ton of sodium follows, a ton of water follows, and the whole intestine becomes just completely filled with, with water. Now, some of you may know because you're thinking, gee, I know the sweat test. That's increased chloride, not decreased. Uh, well, then in the sweat test, which you make a, a skin sweat with a little uh, pile of carpine and a little electric, electric current, the sweat glands in the cystics have a, also have, an imba uh, have a, uh, a defect in reabsorbing chloride from the sweat. We reabsorb chloride from our sweat. And uh, they have that defect too, and that's what you look at the sweat test. So it's a little different. So it's not. It's a, a little different defect than what you see here in the in the GI, in the GI tract and in the uh, uh, lung and the respiratory tree. But anyway, getting back to cholera, which is the subject of the day. So you get tons of intestinal water, and then then you get what's uh, what was termed at the time the blue death. You have a massive increase in intestinal water. You can put out 20 liters per day. And to put that into perspective, our circulating blood volume is five liters. So it doesn't take a lot of profuse watery diarrhea, which is called rice water stools and vomiting, to um, cause profound dehydration and circulatory collapse. Uh, those of you who, who've ever seen anybody in circulatory collapse know that they have this silvery pale uh, slightly somewhat bluish silver color to them. It's different than cyanosis where you have a more intense bluish, almost purplish color. So cholera was the blue death. Uh, the death from pneumonia from Pasteurella pestis was the black death. And then Could you treat by, you know, hyper drinking of water? Be, you'd be vomiting. You can't keep anything down. Uh -huh. You're cooked. You can't keep anything down and you can't uh, and you, have the, uh, you can't rehydrate yourself, although some people survive cholera, it's not that everybody dies. But the cho cholera treatment is fairly straightforward. In, uh, this, in this very sophisticated medical environment shown here, what you have <laughs> is these several liter bottles here of uh, uh, IV fluids that you literally pour, put an IV, big IV into both arms and just pour it in. And uh, the diarrhea literally pours out. Some of these beds have holes in them. Uh, and here's the bedpan here, which just pours out and give them the antibiotic doxycycline. If they can, you can give it IV, you can give it PO, if they can keep it down. And that, that shortens the lifespan, but the disease only lasts a couple of few days anyway. If you just get them through with IV hydration, uh, most people will survive. So now we get to uh, uh, cholera prevention. This is which I wish I had my, uh, um, this will spin in my real presentation, but Cholera prevention is by separation of the water supply from sewage. That's the main thing you do. And hand washing, if you get cholera in your hands, you know, the soap will kill it. It's not a very hardy bacteria. But now we've gone to uh, immunization, of course. And um, what's now used as Vexcora is a or live oral attenuated cholera. And this, what was done to create this is the... Um, is they manipulated the cholera toxin. This is the cholera toxin here. It was originally thought to have two components, an A component at the top and a B component at the bottom. And ultimately it was found that the A component has really two components, subcomponents. So it's A1, which is the, the uh, lavender here, and A2. 
And then on the B is three components. So it's B1, B2, and you guessed it, B3. And then with the CRISPR technology, they uh, deleted uh, most of the A1 subunit here. And this toxin without the A1 subunit is not toxic, doesn't cause any symptoms. But we make great antibodies to it, to the remaining. And these great antibodies are very functional. So that should you meet up with an ordinary cholera with the whole toxin, you've got lots of antibodies against the main component of it, the main body of it. And it really is very effective in reducing the, the, uh, both the, the incidence of cholera and the severity of cholera. And that's what's given now. And there that is, has. Could, could you, uh, your mention of using CRISPR, could you go into a little more details? Because that's, I've never, I've understood what CRISPR is, but I don't understand how it would apply. How would well, it apply? Well, <clears throat> well, it's part of this CRISPR steps. What you do is you can, you can label a component of a uh, bacterium with DNA. And there are enzymes that will, uh, like complementary DNA, and there are enzymes that will uh, specific to cut out certain sections. It just cuts it out. But so it's a knockout gene. You don't replace it. You just knock it out. And that's, a, that's what that te technology enabled. So it used to be, we use this other stuff here, uh, which I can remember, uh, killed whole bacteria. And if you use killed whole, you know, but cholera bacteria, if they killed, there's still, there's still some toxin around in this, and there's a bacterial cell wall. And so we would make antibodies against the bacteria and the modest amount of toxin that you got. But it was nowhere near as effective as the, to as the antibodies produced in the Vexcora. So these are out, these are not used in the United States. These are used in the United States now. So this, this has got to be relatively new, right? Yeah, Vexcora. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, are, are, yeah. are any of these used in the United States? I, I have Vexcora. Clear. Vexcor is. The other ones aren't. Um, so now I thought I would do, um, to get into the subject matter, a waste of spoils and give you a brief history. And I thought I'd begin with Deuteronomy where uh, it says, uh, when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt take a shovel and dig therewith and shall turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. So they were on to it then. Now, so you may know that the Torah is read on the Sabbath sequentially, and the bar mitzvah boy reads the Torah. So some lucky bar mitzvah boy gets to read this passage. I don't know if any of the audience did here. I don't see anybody raising their hands, but um, um, Peter Alvin has kind of a worried look on his face. Was that your half Torah, Peter? That was the story of my whole bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why you brought the shovel up to the Bima? <laughs> Actually, you were there, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so toilets have been around a while to remove the waste product from, from, from other areas. And this is from a Minoan palace way back, uh, except uh, uh, not spelled right, um, uh, on uh, Nossus. And uh, this is in, uh, this shows the uh, woman sitting on the throne here. And the walls are impervious. They're made of gypsum, you know, so they're impervious to water. And then the servant pours water, goes down this hole, and you get a sluice gate and out. And that was that was the deal. That was how it was done. The Romans, not to be outdone, turned uh, turned it all into a social event, and they had um, latrines built beneath this, uh, and basically in the basements of buildings. And that's how they did it. There is a famous story of one of the emperors uh, on the first floor having a big orgy and it collapsed into the latrine. Um, the, in many evil times, they went backwards. They did. Their houses had no running water. They had. They had. Uh, um, they didn't have anything within the house themselves, and they would throw the sewage out onto the street. And these were called missiles of mirth. And finally, people really didn't like that. And um, but there was another way. If you have your own castle, you could have uh, uh, the, the throne here and it would go into a cesspit here. Or if you have a moat, the throne would be here and the waste would go down into the moat, which explains why well, moats were actually so effective. 
Um, and King Richard II, around 1800, he got sick of it all, and he, he passed a, a, a law, a statute, quo nul yak dung, which means uh, uh, that you should not throw yakayo, you should not throw dung. Or, that, uh, that date can't be right. Richard II? Richard II is not 1800. When, he, when is he? Somebody Google it. Somebody Google it. 1400, yeah. somewhere around there. Maybe, maybe I think you're right. I think it was around yeah. 1400. I think you're right. 1800 and, is George III. 1800 you're right, right. right. You're right. You're right. It's about 1400. You are correct, John. Uh, but he didn't, but they you weren't supposed to dump dung anymore. Now, London got very built up. Now we're getting to around 1854. London got very built up. And in the Building Act of 1848, this is when the Act came out, was that all new buildings, there were zillions of old buildings, all new buildings uh, had to be connected to a sewer, not to a cesspool. And the commission set about to connecting cesspools to sewers or removing them altogether, the cesspools. <coughs> and the newer sewer system for London was designed by a man who, I guess he was knighted for this. Uh, it's kind of a funny thing to be knighted for. Uh, so oh. Joseph... So Joseph Basil get what he was knighted for. I think he was knighted for that. And it was an operation until 1875, which was long after 1854. And he was known in the newspapers as the sewer snake. <laughs> now, now, I thought I would go a little bit into a little yeah, architecture and science here. Um, what is the difference between a cesspool and a cesspit? I'm sure you've all been wondering this. Um, a cesspool is a sealed underground pit, or mostly sealed. And a cesspool pit has a soil bottom that permits the leaching of effluent into the ground. And there are intermediate forms of these where there's some leaching. And they all have the same basic structure. They have the, um, the waste comes in here. You have a uh, hatch here for access. <clears throat> and what's ever in here, you'll have the, the, the fatty substances will float to the top. You'll have a surface scum. And then the urine and any other liquids you had to wash, whatever you put in will be here. And any organic matter that's heavier will fall to the bottom as sediment. And this will start to decompose in here somewhat. Uh, there's not much, there's not very little oxygen in these, so they don't compose all, decompose all that fast. And if it's a uh, cess pit, it will have uh, soil at the bottom so you get leaching out of the, leaching more rapidly out here. And the hatches for, for, cleaning the refuse out of the uh, cesspool or cesspit. And this is a picture of a, this is a brick bottom cesspool. It's, it's not gonna be completely impervious. They're not cementing a really, uh, this I think dirt. They're, they're really, it, it's somewhat leaky, has to be. And then um, what they had it's in- like Archaeology, uh, that's archeology span of a cesspit, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, they, they weren't building it. Um, it doesn't look like it was sealed. So. Here, uh, they would have in London, they have the nightmen who would come by and take the heavy organic matter, uh, matter out of the cesspools and, and cesspits and, and cart it away. It was such an unpleasant uh, occupation and people didn't want to see it. So they did it at night and they, and they knew that the material was very good for fertilizer. So it was sold as, of course, night soil. That was the origin of uh, night soil. Now, I'm going to break the timeline a bit because all the scientists in the audience says, wait a minute, i got a septic system here. Well, what's the story? I don't have nightmen coming by. And a septic system has a very large tank here. This is at the beginning. And here's where the, the waste comes in here. And you're still going to get the three layer. You're going to have the lipid layer of scum at the top, wastewater and sludge here. You're going to have an access here or here. And you have access here, which is to, to get to the filter here. Modern day septic tanks have to have really good filters because we have all sorts of plastics that enter the system just from your washing machine. You get you know, polyester fibers and things like that that just aren't biodegradable. So you have to, you have to get them, filter them out. And then you have a whole network. This is only shows one pipe, but, it's one, but there's a whole network of pipes with holes in them into gravel so that the, the, any liquid waste will we'll go into here and uh, you have a, a, a textile, geotextile here so that most of the way it doesn't uh, go up, it goes down into the soil. And there's a lot of, bio, a lot of there's a large tank uh, for uh, the, you know, people in the house and there's a lot of biodegradation that goes on in here. Um, and 
uh, which uh, was very unexpected when it was first uh, uh, discovered. Um, it was discovered by a, a Frenchman, Jean-Louis Maurras in France, around 1850 for his home, he built a very large holding tank prior to, to reaching the waste, reaching his cesspool, very large tank, and he didn't clean it. And in 1860, he said, geez, I better, yeah, better see what kind of residue I got in this thing, it must be full. And he was shocked to find out he had a thin layer of scum oils at the top, a little bit of liquid, and no, and no organic material. It just wasn't there. It had biodegraded in this big tank. And so he leapt to the opportunity and many, many years later, he had a, he made a patent, he published a patent on it in 1880. And he called it La Vidangu's uh, uh, Automatique. Vidangu's means a holding tank. And this is around, eight, he invented around 1860. And here's the large tank, the holding tank, and here's the uh, cesspool or cesspit over here. And here's the access here, here's the waste, and it just sat around and biodegraded. And, and obviously, this is a very successful system. We have them now. So getting into the meat of the area here is this is a picture of London, and this is Broad Street, the famous Broad Street well. Here is the well, which is, uh, or, or also here's the pump to the well. Um, so it's both a well and a pump. And this well is provided by town water. Uh, and here the cesspool here and the uh, wastewater can leach into the well here. And there you go. Now, London was a very dirty place in 1850. Uh, the, the streets were ro roads of horse manure. There were around 300,000 horses in London, which produced, they, the estimate was 2,000 tons of manure per day. Now that's 13 pounds per horse, which sounds about right. Now, not all of them was dumped on the street, but plenty of it was. And there was, you know, people has still had dense wood fires. I think they burned coal and wood at that time. And, but they had tremendous air pollution. The Thames was just absolutely polluted with the sewage from the town. There was no indoor running water to speak of, no sewer, sewer attachments from the home. And they were just getting started at that. And cesspools and cesspits pits were below or adjacent to the houses. So now here is the important point of the uh, medicine at that point. The theory of disease transmission at that point, the paradigm, was that diseases such as cholera, even chlamydia, black death, didn't matter what it was, were caused by miasma, which is a noxious form of bad air, also known as night air. And that's not so far-fetched. The theory held that epidemics were caused by miasma emanating from rotting organic matter. Well, you know, you go near somebody with COVID and the miasma from their breath gives you COVID. You know, it's not that far-fetched. It was a logical fallacy, but it wasn't crazy. It was a model that people believed in. And these are the uh, uh, London, this is a cartoon of the London Board of Health hunting after uh, uh, cases like cholera, they were looking for rotting material. And of course, they weren't going to find it. Uh, but the uh, Board of Health uh, uh, thought it was their mission to, 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 to sniff out disease and to uh, remove its source. Um, and the Thames, of course, was thought to be the main source of miasma because it was highly polluted and had the stench of rotting matter. And here's the from the, I think it's from the London Times. Here's Father uh, Father Thames introducing his law offspring to uh, the fair city of London, which is shown over here. So miasma is the working paradigm, and it's how, how literally everybody thought about disease trans infections, uh, well, disease transmission. <coughs> so in 1849, this is five years before the big cholera outbreak, uh, he wrote a book from his observations on the mode of communication bacteria, that was the book was what it was called. And he had the radical idea that cholera was a disorder of the digestive system, not the blood, and that it was contagious and spread through oral fecal root, larger, largely through contaminated drinking water. Well, this was considered absolutely absurd, just absurd. It was like saying you could see you know, get COVID from the man on the moon. I mean, it was just it's simply absurd. And it was completely, completely ignored. My asthma here is really how disease was transmitted. So 
Jon Snow started looking at, at data after he was completely ignored. Uh, now, London had two main water companies and some other minor water companies, but two main ones that provided the majority of the water for the city, for the pumps, as they were called, or wells. And <clears throat> one was Southwark and Vauxhall, and one with Lam was Lambeth Company. Both of them, prior to 1852, is the city of London and the effluent going this way. Both of them here, where we were Southwark and Vauxhall, Southwark and Vauxhall is shown here, in the Thames River, downstream from the effluent of London. Then in 1852, for unknown reasons, uh, Lambeth Company moved up to here. Nor uh, uh, so they moved uh, upstream from London, so they didn't have the same water. Uh, they didn't have the effluent coming into their uh, water supply. And what Snow did is he looked at the epidemi epidemiology and he looked at the uh, number of cholera cases and he did households and he tried to do it per 10,000 as best he could for uh, people, but it's mostly households. And before the Lambeth, Lambeth move, the number of cholera cases from uh, people who, who drank from Lambeth well uh, uh, pumps was the same as the people from Southwark, uh, Southwark and Vauxhall, just the same. Then his after 1852, in 18 measure, 1854. Overall, you had eight times the, the probability of getting cholera if you drank from Southwark and Vauxhall water than you did from uh, Lambeth. You don't need to be a statistician to figure that out. And then during the first four weeks of the uh, epidemic of cholera epidemic, you had 14 times the chance of, of uh, getting cholera from uh, water from this company than from uh, Lambeth. So you think, oh, so here's Snow's, how he presented his data. Um, he did the number of houses and the deaths from cholera. And here's the Lambeth Company, <coughs> deaths from cholera, number of houses, deaths from cholera, and uh, the, uh, and say, South and Vauxhall. So there were many, uh, they had a little, more, a little less than twice the number of customers and almost 10 times the number of uh, deaths in this little graphic. So you figure, that looks like a checkmate to me. Like, okay, move on. So he published it uh, again, 1854, on the mode of communication of cholera. He presented his data and his findings were, again, largely ignored. And, and this, is, this is the mystery of it. They were ignored. So, so just, just look at what was going on at the time. Now, bacteria, you got to remember, given the benefit of the doubt, bacteria were unknown. Uh, in 1854, Pasteur was just beginning to look at fermentation, uh, the, and the French wine industry was having problems with now bacterial contamination of the wine, and it's getting spoiled, and he was beginning to look and see what the, what was going on in the wine to, to, to spoil it. So he hadn't even embarked upon bacteria. And at that point, you had, this is an obituary from right uh, when the, before the cholera epidemic began. And as his baby Francis, this is spelled with an I, but she's, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, she's referred to as a well, girl. Baby Francis Lewis turned blue and spent after four days of violent diarrhea, died in London's Soho district, that's where Broad Street is, on September 2nd, 1854. Her mother, Sarah, washed out the child's soiled clothes uh, I'm sorry, it was not obituaries. Uh, this is what John Snow wrote. Her mother, Sarah, washed out the child's soiled clothes and tipped in the washing tub out into the cesspool across from the family's front door, three feet from the Broad Street pump. And, and in that area alone, six, 600 people died in a 10-day period. And somewhere in here, I couldn't spot in this giant map, uh, is Broad Street, but... but um, John Snow could see it, and he started to examine it. And first, I'm going to show you the uh, blow up of one section of the map on this infographic. Here is, this is Broad Street, obviously. And here's the pump or well here. And what he did was he put a, a horizontal line for each death that occurred in these households. This might, one, this might be a big building, must be a, uh, a small building. He did it by building. And you'll notice there's a brewery over here that has no deaths. And over here, which I'll show you up here, there's a poorhouse where people lived and worked, and they had very few deaths. Uh, 
Now, this was the first public health infographic. This had never been done. This was a completely new invention that he did. Uh, and infographics really didn't begin to enforce till after that. This is the most famous, one of the most famous early infographics that you may have seen by Charles Joseph Menard. This is where he did uh, Napoleon's 1812 campaign. This is, he did in 1861. But here, Napoleon started with 420,000 men, so he gave it a big, broad brown line. Brown is when it's an uh, invasion, and black is when it's retreat. And as, he go, as Napoleon travels west, this shows the depletion of his army by it. Time he arrived in Moscow, started with 400,000. Now he's got 100,000 left. Then he gets defeated and had, goes back with his tail between his legs. And by the time he got back to uh, Paris, he had 10,000 men. And that's that's a great infographic to explain what was going on. And they showed the temperatures. Now these aren't minus degrees; they just, they just put a dash. But uh, they got caught in the cold in Moscow, and they had lost their they they lost their men and they lost their horses. It was it was a disastrous campaign. And and Menard captured this all in an infographic. But this kind of stuff was was completely unknown in in, in 1854. So he was presenting information for the first time with this kind of infographic. And if we pull out a bit, now the, the color is, is, is added, he didn't have color like this. Here's the Broad Street pump, and there are the other street pumps that people could drink from. Now here's Broad Street, here's the brewery, which had no deaths, and here's the workhouse here that had, I think, six deaths. And, and that was discordant with what he was saying. So he, so he snooped around, he went over, the, went over to the so then what he did was he drew a map here. He took his map and he drew a line with this red line. And this is the, what he called the, the, what was the equidistant line, where if you were here, it was equidistant whether you went to this pump or that pump. And, it was, and he, remember, people had lugged the water. So you'd go to the nearest pump. And uh, you can see the majority of cholera cases were convenient to this pump. Uh, and that's, that's what he showed. But he went over to the to the brewery, so he went over, walked down the block here to the brewery, and is the brewery. And what he found was there were no the people lived and worked in the brewery, as was as a residence in a factory. These people got no cholera, as it turned out, because they used so much water, they had, they shipped in their own water, and the people who worked in the brewery either drank their own water or the inventory, but they didn't drink out of the uh, uh, town water supply. And now here's the Broad Street pump. We go up a, a, a long block here. Here's the workhouse. The workhouse had its own well. And so the people in the workhouse, now there were six, 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 six cases here of, uh, out of uh, several hundred people working in the, in the workhouse. But there was an outlier case, not case, case, in, out in Hempstead at that same time who had cholera. And as it turned out, the family brought sweet Broad Street water, Broad Street pump water to a woman and her niece several miles away. And here's John Snow's notes on the outlier. I was informed by this lady's son that she had not been in the neighborhood of Broad Street for many months. A cart went from Broad Street to West End every day, and it was the custom to take out a large bottle of water from the pump in Broad Street as she preferred it. The water was taken on Thursday, August 31st, and she drank of it in the evening, Thursday evening, and also on Friday. She was seized with cholera on the evening of the latter day, Friday. So she took it in on Thursday, she had cholera by Friday, and she died on Saturday. Now that's cholera. So, and now here's so here's a larger view of the pioneering infographic, and here again, workhouse here are the six deaths, brewery no deaths. Now a dot map, oops, a dot map has its limitations. Dot maps fail to basically they're a numerator without a denominator. They fail to take into account the number of people living in an area and risk to get disease. You have no denominator. And Snow's dot map does not assess the varying densities of the population in the area around the pump. Again, there's no denominator. 
but the statistics were so overwhelming, you really didn't need new, had the denominator to understand the numerator. But that is, you know, looking from a scientific standpoint. Now he wrote if, about the workhouse, if the mortality in the workhouse had been equal to that in the streets immediately surrounding it, it would be upward of 100 persons would have died. And they have six deaths and they had their own well. Now the uh, um, committee, it's a, what is it called? The Medical Council Committee for Scientific Inquiries, basically the Department of Public Health. They did an inquiry for this uh, localized outbreak because uh, uh, 600 people died in a two week period. They did a report and on this report, it's available online. You can read it. I caution you, don't download it. There are many pages, but all these pages are devoted practically are devoted to atmospheric conditions and contamination by the atmosphere by fetid waste. And it is the most boring, awful piece of work that you've ever seen. They went into every nook and cranny showing where all the rotten stuff was. It is dreadful reading. And, and I, so I just took a little quote here. The exhalations from these pestilential banks of mud under the a hot sun are most injurious to the purity of the air. I mean, they wrote like that, but it was just, it was just awful to read that. Now, uh, ultimately, the pump handle was removed. It was kind of a grandstand play. The, uh, the cholera epidemic was, was over. Uh, but it was John Snow got them to uh, uh, remove the pump handle. So it was really symbolic. But this is... Uh, uh, death of the pump handle of the of the of the pump and the people drinking and getting water out of the out of the pump. Hey Jerry, why why was the cholera uh, epidemic uh, over at that point? What because cholera. It? Ah, good question. Because cholera is not suited for life in uh, cesspools, cesspits, and water wells. It's not very viable. It just can't make a go of it. So it doesn't live there very long. And you ingest small amounts of it, and then it multiplies. But it really won't. If it gets into a well, it doesn't stay there. It just can't survive in, in that somewhat anaerobic environment. But isn't it being replaced by all the sick people? They died. Or got yeah, better. I mean, they died after they had intense diarrhea. They surely, did. Surely they did. That that, 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 yeah, that extended for a few weeks. But ultimately, it disappears. It just isn't viable enough. It's why does influenza go away in the springtime? You know, it's not viable enough in in those circumstances to stay for a long. You gotta you gotta keep keep it coming in. And they didn't. Uh, they uh, they just didn't. It just, just doesn't, doesn't reach it. Now it doesn't. The, the cesspools and cesspits didn't have constant communication with the wells. Uh, you need a pretty big inoculum to get in there, and they did. But the epidemics can go along for a while. Jerry, let me let me. Uh, this went on for eight weeks, I think. Let me contrast this with my understanding of what happened in Haiti a number of years ago. That epidemic, that was brought in. That was brought in. They didn't have cholera. That, in absolutely, Haiti. that was allegedly brought in by some some Pakistanis, yeah. or, or something. But you know, be that. It was as the United it, Nations. It's the United Nations. But why did the epidemic last so long if it's self-limiting? Well, because the people try. Uh, well, it's uh, uh, people move around a lot better now than they did then. And uh, I don't understand it, what you mean. Why that makes well, a difference? Well, well, they contaminate in many different places. The water supplies are all mixed up. They have they have reservoirs. They have wells. They have all sorts of of uh, all sorts of waste traveling all different directions. London didn't have that. They had cesspools and cesspits. It's the way how cholera can move around. It's a good question, but it's how, how, how does cholera survive at all? Uh, but it, it moves around in low levels and then people get sick. It just didn't move around London. Uh, they didn't, people didn't travel the way they traveled in Haiti. We had people in cars and driving from this place to that place. That's what kept, keeps it going. And, but they still have to have contamination of the water supply. We don't have- Okay, so, so the etiology in Haiti, allegedly, just to make an assumption, is that assume it was a Pakistani, uh, somebody from Pakistan came in contact with cholera, had it in their body as they were flying in. Fly, yeah. And then when they got to Haiti, they made a contribution to the water supply. Somewhere, right. And then other people took it and they carried it elsewhere and carried it around, carried it around, carried it around. But it wasn't an epidemic, it was more sort of... Um, well, I'm not, I'm not sure how you define an epidemic, but it happened. Uh, it wasn't like, like oh, everybody got sick all on the same day. It was, it was passed around, around, around through the water supply. 
So um, on Dr. Snow's theories, people were unaware of it because he was, he was a big deal there. This is from The Lancet in 1855. The Lancet is a medical magazine still in business. Though people wonder why. In riding his hobby very hard, he has fallen down through a gully hole and has never since been able to get out. Has he any fact to show in proof? No. In other words, they didn't even look at his statistics. They didn't even look. They just dismissed it without looking. They didn't attack his statistics. They didn't say, well, they're invalid because of this or that. They simply didn't look at them. And his obituary was 1858. Didn't even mention it. Dr. John Snow, this well-known physician, died at noon on the 16th instant, at his, I mean 16th day of the month, at his house in Sackville Street from an attack of apoplexy, which is probably a stroke. He was 45, but you remember, he, in those days, he could have had hypertension and it wasn't even recognized as a disease. His researches on chloroform and other anesthetics were appreciated by the profession. <coughs> so there was not a mention of cholera. But they did quickly print a retraction a mere 158 years later, uh, where they wrote with a typical English uh, style, comments such as the above, published in an editorial on Dr. Snow's theories in 1855, were perhaps somewhat overly negative in tone. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> you so, forgot to put the British accent. On yeah, right. <laughs> somewhat over negative in tone, <laughs> really. <laughs> What you had here was a paradigm shift, or, or you didn't have a paradigm shift. Now, and science has a paradigm, which now here we've all lived through these in our own fields and in other fields. Science has a paradigm which remains constant before going through a paradigm shift when current theories can't explain some phenomenon and someone proposes a new theory that better explains the observations. That's when you get a paradigm shift. No must, no fuss, right? Well, as George Bernard Shaw said, all great truths, truths begin as blasphemies. And so we were in 1854 and we are now, I'm afraid. Now, par I've watched paradigm shifts for a long time. And, you know, it said they're painful and they occur one funeral at a time. Now, I'd like to tell you my personal experience or non-experience with a paradigm shift. I was a young pulmonologist when it was discovered that Helicobacter pylori, a bacterium, caused ulcers. And it wasn't stomach acid that caused the ulcer. But the paradigm was that acid caused ulcers and that's what it was. And everybody, including me, had been taught that and believed it, okay? We believed it. It's not that we said, oh, okay, that's it. We believed it. But I was a pulmonologist. This was, I had no dog in this fight. And then when Helicobacter pylori came out, the fellow who did it found it in the ulcers, cultured it, and then, I mean, a little bit crazy, he gave it to himself and he got an ulcer, which is one of Koch's postulates. You take the bacteria, you give it to the next person, and it causes the same disease. And this man was pilloried, not for experimenting on himself, but for stating that ulcers could be caused by a bacteria. It was absolutely absurd, and he was attacked and attacked. And I was a young pulmonologist, and I had no dog in the fight. I was just watching. I said, this is nuts. This guy is obviously right. And these people just, the GI people, couldn't accept it. And he was pilloried for a long period of time before ultimately yeah, the, the facts overwhelmed his critics. And authorities, and I've wondered about this, why people do, why they resist the change. I don't know if anybody read the book. Um, uh, what is that book uh, about birth order and uh, um, willingness to accept theories? Um, I'll, I'll try to think of the book. Whereas uh, firstborn people are uh, far more likely to want, uh, stick to old theories than uh, non-firstborn uh, children. Uh, and uh, ha has to do with um, birth order and flexibility of thinking. But authorities being oh, politicians. It's the Bible. No, no, no. It's a good book. Uh, I have to think of what it is. Uh, authorities, politicians, uh, mostly politicians, but doctors. But, and that's the, I'm getting back to uh, uh, um, 1854. They felt that the fecal oral transmission was too unpleasant for the public to hear. 
There was no secret. And was that propriety? Constituents with a crazy idea that was probably, probably going to be untrue. And at that time, uh, a government held a laissez faire attitude toward uh, uh, public health for poor people. So there was kind of standoffishness of it. And this is the weakest argument is that Jon Snow presented no mechanism of transmission. Well, there are plenty of things that are, can be proven statistically true and that you can't necessarily grasp the mechanism of truth on day one, but the, the statistics are incontrovertible. Yeah, but that hasn't changed. You're right. You yeah. bring me right to the next topic. So <laughs> it Jerry, hasn't changed. Jerry, there, there are other types of waterborne uh, diseases like typhoid in the tropics and, and other ones. I'm surprised that they weren't... A, weren't aware that it was a, a you know mechanism of, of, of transmission and then they just well i don't know when out. typhoid mary was i don't know uh but the mechanism of transmission again uh, they didn't if you don't have a concept of bacteria it's hard to get it's just hard to get to that next step yeah well jerry uh typhoid and uh, i think it was also yellow fever were accepted as waterborne diseases at the time well, at that time but it was tough to get to tough to get to I'm not sure that Reed uh, was that early. Walter Reed was more yellow fever. I think it was a little after that. Well, I think it was uh, more the typhoid from typhoid, the tropics. Yeah. yeah, people did have an understanding. Mary was 1906. Yeah, okay. We well, have, have dysentery and E. coli and some other ones, I think. But uh, they're yeah. severe. Yeah, so there was acceptance that there were waterborne diseases. Sure, sure, sure. Because as, as I've mentioned, this group in, in the Civil War, I wrote about uh, diarrhea in Civil War camps, and it was well understood you had to separate your latrines from your from your food supply. They had no idea why, because uh, uh, Pasteur hadn't come out with bacteria then. Uh, uh, but uh, there was no idea why, but people did understand it. There was, there was coming to an understanding, but not so for cholera. Uh, now, what, what uh, as Charlie what, said, what about what about armies? I mean, you know, didn't they didn't they fairly early know uh, the importance of keeping the uh, waste products separate? Somewhat, from they, some they did somewhat. Now we give them Napoleon had hepatitis A. Went all through his army, and went on his campaign, uh, so it wasn't all that well worked out. Go back now, to it wasn't biblical times. It wasn't biblical right. times. They want in biblical times. They knew there was a problem, but it was hard to really quantify it. It's so easy now because you have a model. You have a paradigm that gives it to you. It just hands it to you, but it, it wasn't handed to them. It was. It was hard to think about. And so we get to the point Charlie's bringing up, and this was talked. This is the uh, thirty thousand foot view. And it warrants some drill down, but this is the 30,000th foot view is the Kuhn cycle. And what Thomas Kuhn, he was out on the West Coast. Um, he wrote, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. And he wrote this cycle here. You have, now let's look at cholera, pre-science, they had miasma which really wasn't science. It was what's called inductive reasoning. That's what Galen used. Inductive reasoning is you set up a premise and then you make every, Galen uh, used the four humors, bile, black bile, uh, blood, and uh, phlegm. And uh, he made all disease states fit into disorders of the, of the humors. That's inductive reasoning. And uh, after 1750, when the L'Academie Francaise really delved into statistics, we started to use deductive reasoning where the data then is used to formulate the hypothesis. And so we use deductive reasoning. So pre-science is inductive reasoning. That was miasma. They just said that was miasma. And then you get to normal science, which is deductive. You have a model, model drift, model crisis, which was say 1854, model revolution, which was very, uh, didn't happen right then. And then a paradigm change and normal science, you go through this over and over. But the question in my, my mind is, oh, Born to Rebel is the book, Born to Rebel. And what they saw, for example, scientists, they looked at scientists' willingness to accept Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin was firstborn. But they found that a non-firstborn, they call them secondborns, but it just means you weren't the oldest. Non-firstborn scientists, uh, 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 being second or more, were eight times more likely to accept Darwin's theory than firstborns. 
And uh, the, the book goes through all sorts of examples of this, where you couldn't relate your birth order to what you were looking at. And it has to do with rigidity of thinking among firstborns. And, and being the often the firstborns are often the prince and the princess. And it's theorized, this may be pop theory, but that the second and thirdborns have to work out alternative theories because the older one's always more capable and, and, and everything. And they have to work out, learn to work on alternative theories. I, but, I don't know what the statistics are these days, but I do remember being told early on in my career that physicists were largely firstborn sons. Uh, there you and go. So were, and so were airline pilots. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> they like, they're, they're the captains of industry. They work in institutions. The secondborns are the travelers, the linguists. They do all the, the artists, they do the crazy stuff. So, um, but if you look at this, not one of us who went to who were science majors said, I'm learning this in college and I'm not going to learn a damn thing after that. I'm not going to accept anything that comes by. I'm not going to do that. In fact, we went through all sorts of changes and it was brought to my attention once some years ago, um, a friend of ours, a woman was going back to work. Her kids had grown up. She was a nurse. And she'd been out of nursing for, I think, 14 years. And she was telling me how hard it was that she's had a study. So everything was new and it was completely different. And I'd been in practice every day. You know? I said, what's new? It doesn't seem like there's that much new. I named a couple, it doesn't seem like that much. And she named all the things that we were doing, which was everything, and everything was new. And it wasn't there 14 years ago. And, I, and when you do it every day, and it changes a little bit, a little bit, you get used to the change. You don't, I'm not a firstborn. You, you get used to the change. And, and so you don't realize how much things change. Um, so I've been wondering why you have certain people, maybe firstborns, resisting the change because that's not, doesn't seem right. And so that it's true. I mean, it is true. What Kuhn says is true. But how could it be? What, what, what? You drill down to this. Uh, this is the thirty thousand foot view. If you drill down, you see some strange. You see some strange things. So, look, looking at bureaucrats, and I always like to look at what's going on nowadays because it's, it's very applicable. Uh, bureaucrats have their own personal interests. They have their career interests. They have all sorts of interests, financial interests, and they're dependent upon politicians for their positions. So they have to play ball. They just have to play ball. Now, just, for, just as a, 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 an important note, 105, the Red Sox away, ho, away opener is a 105 at Yankee Stadium. But I put up Mookie Betts because I'm still bitter about the trade. Even though he didn't have a great season last year, I'm still about, bitter about that trade. And they have an attitude toward, toward public health. And this is one of the, of the things that I find most interesting. Their recommendation paradigm. Now, there are many paradigms in medicine. This is a paradigm how you treat ulcers. This is a paradigm how you treat pneumonia. Paradigms all over the place. Uh, their, their recommendation paradigm now is, we know best, don't ask. And the most recent one, which just, just grabbed me, was the CDC is not releasing the data upon which they make their recommendations, citing that it may be misinterpreted. Yeah, misinterpreted by who? By you because you're going to interpret it the way you want to interpret it. It just, it just made me laugh to hear that, but that is really what they're doing and not giving out their data. Now, I want to show you something about the data. Has everybody seen this stuff, the COVID in the water? Is everybody familiar with this? Yep. This is at the MWA water source. Yep. Now, what you do is you look, they look at BioBots, the company. They send samples. Um, <coughs> they've been do, still doing it, I think, every day. They said they want to cut down, but then I don't think they did yet. They send samples to BioBot every day and look at RNA copies. And this is uh, March of 2000. That's when our first one was. Then uh, December 2000, we had a big uptick. And this is, I think, the Delta around here. And then here's the Omicron here. And this was like 15,000 copies per milliliter. That's a credible number of viral copies per milliliter. But that's what it is. And and then Omicron, as you know, runs so fast, it finds all its targets and it went back down. But you see, there might be a little blip here. So now this is from the North, it's called the North System data. They divide Boston area to North and South, but they're exactly the same. There doesn't seem any real purpose in this. It must be has to do with the way the piping works in the MWRA because they're exactly the same North and South of Boston. Now, if you look at the recent signal here, this is coming down from the Omicron, went down to here, this looks like March or so, 
and then and then now it's and then it had it's heading heading back up. So let me go back. See the signal is going back up here. So it's going back up. So you'd say, gee, they should be tightening. And this is a national pattern too. She said, gee, they should be tightening up, but they're not. What you see that government officials have stopped talking about companies enforcing vaccination for employment. They're not bringing that up anymore. And without any discernible improvement in their data, uh, the CDC has reduced, kind of spell that right, has reduced its masking recommendations. So why could that be? Gee, I wonder why. Well, they saw what happened in Canada where they had the Canadian truck drivers who sit in trucks all alone. They were demanding they be vaccinated and it turned out, and that's supposed to be their constituents of the whatever the Liberal Party is. I don't know much about Canada. These are their constituents and they were getting hammered by their constituents. And they had, they, and American politicians saw that. And then uh, certainly Ron DeSantis has them on their back foot because they're very worried about him running a campaign in uh, 2024. So uh, they, they've eased off on their restrictions in the face of their own data. And so they're going from one paradigm to another paradigm. And it's just entertaining to look at them, see what they're doing and put it in the context of what's going on politically. It's just so interesting uh, to see how they change their paradigms for, for reasons not related to the medical facts, which is the only thing I can really understand. And uh, that, 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 that's all folks, and I got Porky Pig right.